morning, everyone. It is so good to be back. We love you guys. We missed you guys. And, you know, several of you were asking Haley and I how the trip was. And it was good and it was fun. But one thing that was kind of sad about the trip was uh, through our flights getting moved, we weren't able to worship with any saints over in Europe. And that was something we were looking forward to doing, but that didn't happen. And so that made us miss you guys extra. And so it is really good to be back here this morning. Uh, with all of you, and as Rob mentioned in the announcements, we have a lot of visitors with us this morning. And that's encouraging to us, and so uh, if you're local from the community or visiting from out of town, either way, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions about anything that we say, anything that we do here, uh, don't hesitate to ask, and we'll be happy to, to chat with you about that. Uh, just to our members here, just a quick reminder that we have some things going on today and tomorrow. Remember the congregational meeting after services today, and then tonight the evangelism workshop will be at 5 o'clock. And we're going to be focusing kind of on the LDS uh, temple tour that a lot of us took recently. And so I know that's kind of fresh on the mind, and so uh, if you're interested to learn more about that, come out tonight at 5 o'clock for that, and then tomorrow night at 8.30, remember we have prayer night. And so I know... Once a month, that one's easy to forget about. So I set a reminder myself, so just want to make you aware of those things. Uh, before our lesson this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you would please take your Bible out and turn over to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be looking primarily at verses 17 through 24. And Ephesians is a book that's so pleasant to kind of outline an overview. The, the first three chapters is more doctrinal, and chapters four through six is more practical and kind of the application. And in chapter four, the, the section we're going to be focusing on in verses 17 through 24 is actually set in context of the first three verses of this chapter. And, and so I, I would point you there to the beginning of this chapter where Paul is appealing to the saints at Ephesus and also to us now that we're to live a life worthy of the calling that we have been given in Christ. And so that, that's kind of one of the overarching themes really of chapter 4. I know unity is definitely a big one. But part of what Paul is going to appeal in this chapter is that that means that you don't live like the world. You don't live like the world anymore. You don't walk the way that Gentiles walk. And Gentiles, in the context of this chapter, in the passage we're going to be studying, means it's simply someone that doesn't belong to Christ. Someone who's not circumcised in heart by Christ. Don't live like them any longer. And so let's read this. We're going to kind of break up this section here in verses 17 through 24 into two. And the first is in verses 17 through 19. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. It says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And that is, uh, and we'll stop there in verse 19. I was getting ahead of myself. You know where all these problems that we just read about, you know where all these different things that, that Paul's describing in these verses, you know what it stems from? It's at the end of verse 18. At the end of verse 18, it's due to their hardness of heart. Now that's ultimately where a lot of this problem, where, where it stems from, where, where it starts from. And you know, they're hard hearts that resulted in things like being ignorant in mind. Or as verse 17, I'm reading from the ESV, describes it, being darkened. We use an expression in our language, we say you are what you eat. Right? We, we use that one uh, somewhat frequently. But here Paul kind of appeals to that you, you are what you think. You are what you think. What, what, what is in your mind? You know, stubbornness so quickly leads to warped thinking, distorted thinking of the mind. You know, for instance, I would guess, if you're like me, you probably don't do your best thinking when you're being pretty stubborn. You know, when you're digging your heels and trying to prove a point, that's probably not when you're pretty level-headed, doing rational thinking, rational thought. No, not at all. And that's kind of the point that's being made here. Often it is warped thinking that takes us in the wrong direction. And that's why we sin, is it not? Because our thinking is off. Our thinking, our minds are futile. Using that language from here in Ephesians chapter 4. The, the way that we look at life, the way we look at ourselves, the ways that we look at others, it's off. It's distorted. 
And so wrong thinking naturally leads to wrong living, wrong actions. And I think we see that play out in our own lives. But isn't it kind of humorous how the world will often lob this jab at Christians and say that, hey, you are close-minded. You're narrow-minded in kind of your approach, how you see things. Get what Paul's saying here, though. Without Jesus, without God in your life, guess what? That's closed-mindedness. That's a closed-minded way of living because knowing Christ, that opens the mind. Knowing God, that's true enlightenment. And so kind of backwards, countercultural from how people think about what closed-mindedness is when we read Ephesians chapter 4, because knowing Christ, that removes futility. Knowing God and knowing His Son, that takes us out of darkness and into light. That is enlightenment. But you know, when you have futility of mind, darkness and hardness of heart take over and ignorance, and you know what that results in? It's verse 19. It results in a loss of sensitivity. You become callous. You know, and and when our thinking is warped, we, we lose our sense of shame. Things that maybe once would have made you blush, things that once would have really bothered you, all of a sudden you lose that sensitivity and it doesn't affect you the way that it used to. Think about this. Some some of you, there's two types of people in the world, right? People that like to wear socks and people that don't. I'm a sock person. I always have socks on. I'm the, the weird guy at the beach. I have my socks on my feet. But some of you that love to wear, you know, Crocs and different things like that, you know, you always uh, are sockless. Guess what? Your feet develop callus. And you can walk on that blazing hot sand on the beach and it doesn't bother you. You've lost that sensitivity. And it doesn't happen all at once, but it slowly happens over time. And the same thing, guess what? It happens with our hearts. It happens with our minds. When our thinking becomes warped, naturally that's going to affect every aspect of our lives. But we need that shame. Well, we need some sensitivity in our hearts, in our minds, because without it, that puts us on a path of self-destruction. The idea in verse 19 is someone who becomes consumed by their sins. It's utter self-destruction. And how do you get there? It's not that hard to see. We see the downward spiral that kind of takes place in these verses. That's what I've been describing. In Ephesians 4, just verses 17 through 19, it is a great passage for further reading. I would say go read Romans 1 again and see how that kind of plays out with what the Apostle Paul writes there. But can I warn you this? That is, if as we were talking about these things and reflecting on these verses that we've covered so far, if, if in your mind you've been thinking about someone else, you've been listening wrong. You've been reading wrong. Because Ephesians 4, the context here, Paul's writing the Christians. He's writing the Christians, and that means, guess what? Christians have problems. This is something we have to be on guard against. This can happen. This can develop in our lives. And so before we're so focused on everybody else, how someone else needs to hear this lesson, or someone else needs to think about these things, we need to see ourselves first in what we just read. We're not any different than the world around us unless we are transformed by Christ. When Haley and I were living in Florida, there was a short time that I drove for Uber. And I didn't do this to, like, make money. I did it as an opportunity to make contacts, right? Kind of get people trapped in your car. That sounds weird. But uh, they're they're forcing the conversation with you. Because I noticed from times when we would travel... We would, uh, you know, be the customer on the end of an Uber. The question you kind of make it with small talk is like, hey, do you do this full time or do you do this like part time? And sure enough, that question got asked me all the time. And that was a great door opener to be like, no, I'm a preacher. And it, it led to a bunch of different discussions and many, many stories. But as you can imagine, when, whenever you let a complete stranger get in your car, there's going to be some awkward interactions. I'm not going to do story time now about like the funny ones. Ask me about that later, and I'll share that with you. But uh, I do want to share one interaction that stuck with me to this uh, day. It was like my first week of driving. Can't, can't make this up. Uh, and I was about finished for the day. Haley and I kind of had a rule about me driving for Uber that I wasn't going to do it at night to just avoid a lot of uncomfortable situations, and we didn't want it to, you know, interfere from our time together 
uh, when she was off work. And so it was like 4.30, last um, pickup that I was going to take for the day. And these two girls get in my car, probably late 20s, and I'm young 20s at the time, like 22, 23. Um, and I knew right when they got into the car that they had been drinking, right? There, there were some signs, but then once the doors were closed and after a few minutes, you can smell it. Like they just kind of reek of alcohol. And then to take it a step further, they pull like these massive bottles of wine out of their purse and like are trying to consume it, which can't, can't happen, right? And so I ask them to put it away and they're like, yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. And uh, they began to just kind of talk in the back seat about their plans for the night. And here are like these probably 25 to 30 year old, two young ladies, and they're just talking about how they're excited to get their drink on. That's what they were saying. Uh, one of the girls said, I'm so thankful for Uber that I don't have to get another DUI. And I was thankful for that as well. Like they're, they're just like talking about all these things. They're making it very clear what their plans are for the night. Uh, and I'm in the front seat, as you can imagine, I'm so uncomfortable. I'm like, what would someone from my congregation think if like, they see me right now with like two girls in the back seat with like bottles of wine in their hand? Like, what is just going on? Like, do I casually mention First Peter 5, 8 as discussion? Like, we're called to live sober-minded lives? Like, I, I was panicking internally on the outside. I'm sure I just look like a quiet Uber driver. <laughs> But the conversation changed when they asked the go-to question. They said, so do you like drive for Uber full time? And I said, uh, no, I'm, I'm a preacher. And there was like a five second awkward silence. <laughs> and one of the girls, she was like, after five seconds, she's like, cool. And goes back, you know, she pulls out her phone and she's doing stuff. But one of the girls, I mean, notably, like I can just tell in the, in the mirror, her demeanor, everything changed. And so she's sitting there in silence for a couple minutes, and they don't ask follow-up questions. And uh, I'm just kind of waiting to see what's happening, because something's definitely going on with this one girl. And after this, she kind of broke the silence, and she said, it's a sign. And I'm not sure if she's talking to me or her friend. And she's like, it's, it's a sign. And she was talking to me. And she began to explain how... She just got out of a long, nasty breakup, and her mom said, hey, you need to get like God back in your life. Some things need the change in your life. And she finished that kind of story by saying, and now my Uber driver is a preacher. She's like, this is a sign. And so for the rest of the time, we got to talk about the Bible. She said she bought um, not just a regular Bible, she bought a book you can get at Walmart, like the Bi reading the Bible for dummies. It's actually a book. Because she had no idea how to like sit down and like, how do I open up the Bible and read it and understand it? And so she was asking like, hey, where do I start? What do I need to know? And so I was talking with her about that, recommended like, hey, the Gospel of Mark is like a good starting place among other things. Um, and it's so interesting. We're having this conversation and her friends like interrupting the whole time. Like, like, oh my goodness, did you, did you see what Joe did on? And like showing her Snapchat and she's like pushing the phone away like we're talking. And as we got to their destination, which was a club, I handed her a Bible and my business card and she took it and they got out. When I picked them up, like I said, their, their plan was clear. They had already been drinking, they were planning to continue drinking, and they were going out to party with friends and have a, a fun Friday night. But when I dropped them off, for one of the girls, her conscience was pricked. Her heart was bothered, and all it took was just saying I was a preacher. It's not like I did anything groundbreaking in, in that story to, to cause that. She got out of the car looking like she was going to cry. She was a mess. Uh, and I know that's a long story, but it kind of serves as an illustration that I want you to kind of consider this morning, that this girl had a good heart. She, she did. Uh, she recognized and admitted that she needed the change in her life, that what she was doing was kind of what we read in verses 17 through 19. It was a path of self-destruction. She was consumed by a type of lifestyle that she knew was not healthy, not just physically, but spiritually. She felt shame. She felt guilt. She knew she needed a new life. 
And I'll admit, I don't know how the story ends for that girl. I know, sorry for like a cliffhanger. If you were waiting to see, like she came to the services next Sunday, she got back. I, I wish. I never heard back from her. And I don't, I don't know how that story ends from her. Maybe she goes inside and she drowns her guilt with more alcohol. Maybe she goes in and just reads her Bible at the bar. Like, I, I don't know what that story ends for her. But why do I share that story? Because here's this girl that recognized that she needed Jesus. She had been taught some about Jesus. I was able to share a little bit of the gospel with her and what I could in about 10 to 15 minutes. But by her own admission, she had a, was living a sinful life and she needed change. And so what she had in front of her was what we all have in front of us each and every day. And that's a choice, with, which ties in really well with what Jason talked about before the Lord's Supper. The choices that we make. And, and guys, I want to tell you, decisions like this don't stop just because we become a Christian. They're decisions, they're choices that we have to make every single day of our lives. But, but here's the rub. If, you've, if you have learned Christ, you can't live like the world anymore. You must not live like the world anymore. Knowledge demands a change. I doubt that this girl, when she went back into the club, when I dropped them off, that she had a fun night based on how she looked. Maybe she did. But guys, when you learn about Jesus, it requires a change. And that means for us, being, being a Christian doesn't mean you just live a little nicer of a life, do, do a little bit better things, and you go to church every once in a while. That's, that's not really what following Jesus is about. I, I want you to see what a new man in Christ looks like. Again, written to Christians. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says, picking up in Ephesians 4 and verse 20. After that downward spiral, verse 20, he says, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so we read this passage, and we can see what sticks out about the believer, about the new man, the, the new creation in Christ. It's someone that has learned Christ, someone who has been heard Him and taught in Him according to the truth that is in Jesus. But you know, a lot of that, depends on verse 22, the idea of putting off a certain way of living. That, that idea of that word, that phrase, putting off, is the idea of laying aside, setting aside, oftentimes clothing, that you would take a, clo a clothing or a garment off and lay it on the side. And so that's where we see that exact thing happen in Acts chapter 7 and verse 58. Remember when Stephen is stoned in that chapter and those who took place in that, they took off their garments and they laid them at the feet of a man named Saul. And so that, that's the idea of what it means to, to kind of put off. And so since our old way of thinking, it was warped, it was corrupt, it was distorted, we, we lay that aside, we, we put that off because it wasn't working. It's not the way that God intends us to live, the way to think. You know, I have some old shirts that Haley wants to throw out. She wants to burn them. But I don't let her because, you know what, those are my comfy shirts. I, I like them. You have shirts like that, too, that your spouse or significant other can't stand when you put it on. But you know why we go back to things like that? It's comfortable. We like it. And sometimes putting, on, putting off things that, that we've grown accustomed to, that, that we like, that we're attached to is hard. And that's why we don't like to put on something that, that's new, something that's different. And that can happen to us spiritually. We go back to those old habits because it's what we like. It's what we've grown accustomed to. But putting off the old self, let me be clear, it's not just changing a few things in your life. Not just saying, uh, stop saying a few certain words or certain things like that. Yes, we, we change our behavior when we put on the new man, yes. But we change the way we think about life fundamentally as well. Our mind has been changed. That's what verse 23 is getting at. Our behavior is always going to struggle to be fixed until our mind is fixed with it. 
in our minds, our thinking is to be renewed, to be restored. It's like in your mind, a filter is put in place. And you know what that filter is? The filter is Jesus Christ. And so instead of doing my will, it's now been, I filter it through, what would Jesus have me do? Well, what does his word dictate? Well, what is his will for my life? And so we see this new life, this new man, really you could summarize it as the Christian life. And it's a beautiful thing. It's someone who's, you've learned Christ. You've heard him. You were taught in him. The truth is in Jesus. And what that results in is you have a new nature. A new nature in verse 24 is righteousness and holiness. You know, this new self is created after the likeness of God. So often in a lot of our mentalities in America today, people are saying, hey, you need to be the best version of you. I'm not trying to be the best version of PJ. PJ is the problem in the first place. We, we need to be, make sure we have a biblical mindset and what we're trying to be, but what we're trying to become. We're trying to be imitators of Christ, are we not? And how that happens is, having righteousness and holiness. That's the image. That's the likeness we're going off of. I want to be like Christ. And so how do we put off, put on the new self, verse 24, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness? I'm not going to do a part two sermon. Jason's already got on to me about, you know, uh, flipping another slide. We'll see how long I go. Too bad we have a congregational meeting or else I'd go long, but. But let's let's make it clear. Putting on this new man, it's it's not possible without Jesus Christ and his blood. It's not possible. It's not something that we can do on our own. But there is something that that we have a part to play in this as well. I think a lot of this language, not just the phrase put on, but more a reference to verse 24, goes so well with Romans chapter 6. Verses, uh, really the first 11 verses of that chapter, Josh read part of that for us in the scripture reading where, where the description of baptism is seen. And I would suggest to you, right, like sometimes we go the arguments about like, do I have to be baptized to be saved? Maybe you've had those conversations with different people. I would argue, yes, scripture teaches you must be baptized to be saved. But Romans chapter 6, it's not a chapter even on the necessity of baptism because These are baptized believers. That's a given in what Paul is arguing and what he's writing about here in the description. You know, for Paul, baptism is is never considered apart from a relationship with Christ. And so I want you to see some of the similarities of that language, that baptism symbolically is a reenactment of Christ's resurrection. That the same way Jesus died was buried and raised to life. That happens to us when we put on Christ in baptism. We, we are dead to sin. We put it to death. That happens before we are buried, right? You don't put a living person in the ground. They're dead first. And, and that's what happens to us in, in the water. That's where we are buried with Christ, come in contact with the blood, and we are raised to do what? To walk in newness of life. And so does this new man in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, does that characterize your life? Is, is that the part of Ephesians 4 that matches your life? I hope it is. No, I, I often think about that lady from that Uber ride. I hope she read the Bible. I hope she, to this day, is continuing to seek after Jesus and that she has, has found the truth and the peace and the hope that she was so desperately looking for. But again, I, I don't know where that story ends for her. But you know, I'm afraid so many times I I look like her in my own life. There are little things that are said in conversations, little little things that when when I read God's word that they prick my heart, that my conscience is bothered and it, it maybe ruins my day because I recognize that something needs to happen. But you know what happens when I wake up the next day? I go back doing what I, what I was before. And so this morning, really, largely this lesson is a plea for us, a reminder for us that we need to not live like the world. Where the language that Apostle Paul uses here, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. It's not the way that God intends us to live. It's not in line with his calling. Since I have learned Christ, I need to stop living like the world. And you know those times where your heart is pricked, where your conscience is bothered by the actions, by the life that you are living, maybe because it's a result of a hard heart 
that then affects your, your thinking, uh, you know, the darkness that kind of settles in, in the mind. But, but you know, when, when that happens and your heart is pricked and your conscience is bothered uh, and you feel sorrow, that's good. That, that's good. We, we need that shame. But here's the thing, guys. Sorrow is not repentance. Sorrow is a good thing, but sorrow is not repentance. Rather, we must let sorrow, shame, and guilt produce godly sorrow that leads to repentance. It precedes repentance. Read 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 through 11. And so I'll end with this passage, James 4, 17. So whoever knows to do the right thing and fails to do it, for him it is sin. If you're here and you have learned Christ, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You must no longer live like the world. Be clothed with righteousness and holiness that comes from Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, understand that Jesus invites all to come to him and learn from him, right? That's the passage we've been reading from Matthew 11 uses that language. If you're here and there's anything that we can do to help you on your spiritual walk, please don't hesitate to come and let us know. You don't have to come up to the front at this time, but please do something about that if there is a need. If you're here in subject to Evan's invitation, we invite you to come in front as we stay and sing the song. Select.